Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. I want to thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I'm Michaela Hall, Assistant Director of the Library. I'd also like to thank uh, all the hard work that lots of people put in tonight to make this happen, especially Belinda Decay, the Library Director, of course, Tom Shook, Lee Howard, Downing Simmons Jr., Gregory Simmons, and Lynn Stallworth. We can't thank you enough for putting this all together. Uh, as I've been saying, which you're probably sick of me hearing me say right now, please keep your videos and your mics off um, unless by, asked by myself, Tom or Lee, to turn them on just so we don't have any uh, lag or interference during the presentation. Um, if you have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, please type them in the chat and all your questions will be answered when we are ready to open up the Q&A portion of the program. Um, I have posted a link in the chat, which I hope everyone can see. I'll post it again just in case. And it's a list of resources that Tom has put together that he wanted to share everyone. Um, and I'm also recording the program. So we will remove all personal information such as names of participants because we are gonna upload it onto our YouTube channel um, so that people who couldn't attend um, and we have a, a long wait list so everyone can uh, view it after the fact. And thank you again, everyone, and I will turn it over to Belinda. Well, thank you, Michaela, for being our host and running our Zoom meeting so beautifully. Um, it, it just wouldn't, clearly wouldn't happen without you. So thank you for all that you do. And welcome to everyone who has joined us this afternoon for our Stonington Free Library Thoughtful Thursday program. It's the third in of three linked programs that grew out of the one that we had in August on Frederick Douglass in New London, based on a front page story in the day by Lee Howard that was based on research by Tom Shook. And it's just amazing what has grown out of this. This program, like the two that preceded it, present the challenge of systemic racism as it figures in our own local history and it continues the conversation that began with that story of Frederick Douglass in New London. So it really is remarkable. And I'm so exciting to have you all here, including Tom's special guests. And now um, Tom is here this afternoon to talk about the Negro Motorist Green Book. And as Tom says, this wasn't just a travel guide, it was a survival guide for black travelers and it has now become a history book, a read between the lines chronicle of mid 20th century life for both black and white, North and South, including New London and Stonington in Jim Crow America. Tom will also be talking about the Orchard House, a Greenbrook listing that was on Route 1 in Stonington across from Stonington High School. And it was during one of these programs that Tom realized that there was a lot more information out there and he began to gather it because he has such amazing curiosity and enthusiasm. So everything has been growing as we go along and I really hope that it, this conversation will continue and the library will look for ways to make this, this happen. Tom Shook is a, a New London native and a graduate of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C with a long-standing interest in social justice issues, which is very clear from the work that he does now. He retired after 38 years as executive director of a local residential um, fa facility for troubled adolescent males. He has an avid interest in history, particularly John Brown and the Civil War, but as a lifelong Sherlock Holmes fan, his area of special interest 
has become unknown, hidden, forgotten, or suppressed local history. So we are so lucky to have the fruits of all his research. And this is what led him to the story of Frederick Douglass in New London, as well as the city's connection to the Green Book. And it is this, as I said, his insatiable curiosity ever since and that has led Tom to make more discoveries um, since our first meeting. And um, Lee Howard, who is our faithful moderator, has done it, this is the third time, and we depend so much on his guidance of, of these um, conversations. So thank you, Lee, for being with us again. And Lee is the New London Days community editor and currently runs nine Times Weekly Newspapers, operated by the day. He's a graduate of Washington Lee University, and over his 40-year career in journalism, he has received many awards, in particular the pres prestigious Theodore Driscoll Award for Investigative Reporting from the Connecticut Society of Professional Journalists. In 2008, he received a fellowship from the National Press Foundation in Washington, D.C., and that is just two of a long list of awards. He served in every department on the day, is an avid tennis player, youth basketball coach, and volunteers for the Special Olympics. I also add that he is a passionate supporter of libraries and has a wonderful understanding of their value in the life of any community and their role in sustaining of democracy which is my way, my segue into saying that this same applies to local newspapers, how vital they are and how we need to support them. These guardians of our collective community memory cannot be valued too highly or protected too much. So thank you, Lee, for being with us. And now it is for the greatest pleasure, I welcome our speaker for this evening, Tom Shook and our moderator, Lee Howard. And Tom, as you will find out, is bringing special guests to the program and I will let him introduce them. And we're so glad to welcome you all. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Belinda. It's a real pleasure, it's a real honor to be here. I am so grateful just to be a part of what's gonna happen here tonight because I think it's a story uh, that most of us have never heard before, uh, uh, even though we may be aware of it. I wanna start out, the, the title of this is, is the Negro Motors Green Book, uh, and it's a story of community, resilience, and entrepreneurship. Uh, I wanna start with a, 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 it's more than a shout out, I wanna honor someone without whom we would not be having this program tonight. This is Doris Simmons. She is known to three of our honored guests by a different name. She is known as Mom. And I wanna, she could not be with us here tonight. She's 97 years old. Uh, and folks, this is not ancient history. This is, this is living history and she's an example of that. She is in North Carolina and could not join us tonight, but we wanna reach out to her and thank her and express our gratitude. So hello, Doris Simmons. Uh, Okay, uh, Lee, this is, the, uh, this is the cover of the Green Book. Uh, I think I, I'm ready to get started. I do wanna warn people, I got a lot of information here. It usually takes me two months to tell this story. <laughs> We're gonna try to do it in about 30 minutes or less. Uh, so uh, hang in there. Go ahead. Hi, Tom. Yep, Tom, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, thank you for showing uh, what we're gonna be talking about tonight because I think it is kind of amazing to actually see it in person. Uh, these were actual books that people bought, and uh, it's sort of an amazing slice of American history. And I know, uh, you know, obviously the Green Book came out a couple of years ago, but you sort of became uh, familiar and interested in the Green Book before that. So if you could tell me a little bit about what your interest was and uh, what should people know about the Green Book that didn't come through in the movie? <laughs> Most of what they're going to learn tonight for, for openness. Well, I, start, I did start doing this. When you say the Green Book, you're talking about the movie that came out two, uh, a year or so ago. Right. I did start uh, researching this about three years ago uh, when I, I stumbled on it somehow. I, don't, I, I didn't know anything about it, and I came across, and it was a Green Book, and it was a listing of uh, uh, businesses. And I, uh, my, I grew up, my dad had a gas station. Uh, in New London. And so I was curious to know if my dad's gas station was listed in the Green Book. 
And so I got a, a copy of the book. Uh, you, by the way, you can get uh, you can go online and you can read every page of every book that they have, which is about 25 of them down at the New York uh, Public Library uh, online. Uh, and uh, I discovered that he was not in there. And I thought that, you know, and then I, I looked further and I found that there were no gas stations in southeastern Connecticut listed. Uh, and I thought, okay, uh, what is listed there? So I started going through, uh, looking through all the books uh, to see how, what kind of connection there was to, to New London. And this is what I found. There were 10 places, uh, to mostly tourist homes and later on a couple of hotels and a, a beauty shop that were listed as, as uh, places that would, uh, that would uh, accept uh, patronage from uh, black customers. Uh, we were living in uh, Jim Crow America, and I choose those words very carefully. Not the Jim Crow South, this is Jim Crow America. And there were 10 places in New London. I, I was fascinated by it. But let me back up a little bit and start with the story. Okay, what is the Green Book? The Green Book, this is Victor Green on the left. Uh, the book was named for him. He was the founder and the publisher of it. He was a postman in New York, uh, and he uh, was familiar with, with the neighborhood and was aware that there was a need for uh, a guide uh, for, uh, for black uh, customers. So uh, he went around and uh, he, de he developed it. That's his wife to the left. Together they published it uh, until he died in 1960. Uh, she published it for a few years after that, and then they turned it over at the end to another to another uh, guy that ran it. So what was the, the green book? It was at least three things. It's a travel guide, like many other travel guides. It's a survival guide, and it's a history book. Uh, let's start with the, with the travel guide. Uh, it's a travel guide like many others. Here's the, here's the first edition on the left. That's the 1937 edition. It was 18 pages long. It focused only on New York City, New York City area. Uh, they got such a tremendous response to that, that the, they decided the next year they would go national. And so they went, they went national. Uh, by, the, by the end of the run, in 1937, it was 18 pages. By 1967, it was 128 pages. Okay, and the one on the, on the right we see is the 1948 edition. You can see it's come a long way. We have drawings. We have uh, a, a pair of uh, dapper looking uh, individuals heading off on a vacation. Okay. This is what the inside looks like of that 1948 edition. I chose this page because if you look down the left column, you'll see New London is listed there. At this point, there are four places listed. There were a total of 10, but they kind of came and went over the years. And that was the way some of the in and out of business or in and out of uh, having an advertisement in there. Uh, one of the most famous is in there. It's the Hempstead Cottage. If we have time, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, okay, there were also ads uh, in there, just like any place else. Esso, uh, Esso gas station. Esso plays an important role uh, in, the, in the Green Book history. Uh, there's also places like the uh, Apollo Theater, world famous uh, advertising there. And there are places that were not so famous. Quinn's Hotel in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And using the vernacular that is used in the book, it was the most fabulous hotel for color. Now, what, what that reminds us of is the era that we're living in. We don't use those terms anymore, but that was the way it was advertised in the book. Uh, there are also folksy stories down here. Uh, the uh, how to keep from growing old, a little humor thrown in. Drive stupidly and you will, don't have to worry about growing old. They put in stories like that from time to time. They also put in, uh, after the war particularly, when, when the returning GIs came back and were establishing their families and they had some discretionary money, the, the uh, auto man manufacturers realized that there is a revenue stream there. And they started catering more and more to black audiences. So they would advertise and tell stories about uh, the, all of the new models. But beyond that, it was, a, it was a survival guide. It was more than just a travel guide. And, and this, is, this is a quote from the book. Uh, the, uh, if you read the last sentence of this quote here, it says, this guide has made traveling more popular without encountering embarrassing situations. Okay, that's the genesis of this book. Uh, the, uh, Victor Green had a death in the family. I think it was a death in his wife's family. And he needed to travel to the funeral. So he went, I, I don't remember where it was, Kentucky or uh, someplace in the South. And during that time, he experienced the, the difficulty of, of traveling. He's very diplomatic in calling it embarrassing situations. What they really were, were racist, humiliating, degrading, debasing, and potentially lethal situations, okay? Uh, the, this uh, Green Book became a guide to navigating the dangerous landscape 
of Jim Crow America. And again, I choose those words very carefully. Uh, a lot of us, I had always thought of Jim Crow as being the Jim Crow South. But what we know, what we know after looking through uh, this and seeing a map of New London, it was Jim Crow America. And there's another name for what, for Jim Crow. We don't like to use the term apartheid. Uh, we think of apartheid as something that happened with those awful people in South Africa and what they did over there. But the fact of the matter is, Apartheid in South Africa didn't start until 1948, okay? By 1948, the Jim Crow system in America had been in existence for 60 or 70 years. They based that South African apartheid on some of what was done here in, Jim, in the Jim Crow system. Uh, they went far beyond that, of course, but it was, uh, it, it, it was in, large, in a large way uh, based on uh, the Jim Crow system. Okay, if you go through the book here, you go through the, you'll see the, at the top of the page, you'll see all sorts of cautionary statements, like keep this guide with you, use it as your identification, carry your green book with you, you may need it. Kind of a don't leave home without it. Uh, and you'll see there's a quote there from uh, Mark Twain, travel is fatal to prejudice. That's something that was very important to, to Victor Green, that travel was important. And in spite of, and he uses the term housing conditions make this necessary. Again, he's, he's using very, uh, diplomatic language. Uh, the, the problem was racism and segregation. Uh, and, and, the, and the Green Book was something that provided uh, a potential solution to it. How dangerous was it? Uh, many of us maybe by now have heard of, of sundown towns. Uh, what was a sundown town? Uh, that was, they were all over in America. Okay, there were sundown towns in Connecticut. There were sundown towns in New England. Uh, what that meant was if you were a person of color, you had to be out of town out of that town when sundown came. Uh, there were signs at the edges of towns. Uh, there were, did I just lose something here? No, you're good. I don't see my, I just lost my, oh, there we go, okay. Oops, sorry, uh, my screen just disappeared. Uh, there were sundown towns uh, all over. And if you were a person of color and you were found in a sundown town, you were in danger, okay? Your life was in danger and you needed to know. And if you were simply traveling through uh, an area and you didn't know where you were, you were in trouble. So you needed to know, uh, you needed a guide uh, to do that. Uh, and again, the Jim Crow America versus the Jim Crow South, there were more sundown towns in the state of Illinois than there were in Mississippi. So that tells you something about America in the 30s and 40s, okay? Uh, there were coping skills. Uh, people developed what's, what was called a Jim Crow traveling kit. Uh, this meant, uh, well, for, for example, if, if, if I uh, experienced a death in my family and I needed to travel to the South, I would jump in the car, this is in the, back in those days, jump in the car and uh, you know, stay at a motel, grab a bite to eat and just drive there. Okay, if you were a person of color, okay, before you left home, you needed to know where you're gonna stay, where are you going to buy gas? Where are you going to eat? Where are you going to get a drink of water? Where are you going to use the bathroom? Okay, because it was legal at that time to deny service based on your race. Okay, it was legal. Okay, uh, and so you needed to be prepared for that. In addition to worrying about the Jim Crow, I mean the uh, sundown towns, you needed to take a Jim Crow kit would include food, a gas can, uh, uh, there would be a cooler for drinks, uh, and there would be something called a pecan, a pecan, okay? This was not a pecan pie. This was what you might have to use to, to for the bathroom because you could be denied service uh, at, at, any, at many of these places down there. So you can see the value of the Green Book because they would give you a guide. You could map out your trip based on locations that you knew you could rely on. They would accept your service, not a problem. Okay, during this period, uh, the Green Book uh, had an ally, uh, and that ally, a big ally, was ESO, was Standard Oil of New Jersey. They recognized that, I don't know what exactly their thinking was, but they recognized at the very least that there was a customer base there. And so they, uh, the, ESO was the only major oil company that would allow blacks to uh, establish franchises. All the other ones denied it. My dad had a Sunoco station. I never knew anything about this, but maybe that, that may be the, why, the reason why he wasn't in that book. 
But anyway, uh, Esso was very supportive and collaborated with, with Victor Green. Uh, they had the two gentlemen in the, in the left-hand corner there were uh, James Billboard Jackson, uh, seated at the desk, and Wendell Alston. And they were known as the race group in, uh, in, uh, in Esso. And what they did was go around and develop uh, relationships and collaborations with the black community. That would mean establishing franchises, uh, and providing services. Uh, they made sure that, for example, the, uh, the Green Book wasn't available. You couldn't go to CVS and, and get a copy of the Green Book. Uh, you had to get it by a subscription from Victor Hugo, or you had to get it at certain places uh, that were, were listed in there, or you could get it at any ESSO station. ESSO station was the only place they carried it. Okay. Uh, they also contributed articles to the Green Book. Uh, the two articles here, it's James Jackson's uh, and you can see, obviously, very relevant to the topic at hand, where are you going to stop? Uh, and he wrote a whole article about that. And Wendell Alston wrote the other article, it helps solve your travel problems. And you can see, this was their collaboration. They say it in one of those articles, this is a quote from it, where they say, come to ESSO for all your car needs, and you know, we'll take care of you, and go to Victor, Victor Green for your trip needs. And if you see, bless the Green Book and its service right in there. And that, uh, that's a quote from one of the uh, articles that they wrote. Okay, it's also a history book. It's a chronicle of mid 20th century America. And it's a story of family, community, resilience, and entrepreneurship. And there is no better example of that sense of family and community and of steadfast resilience and courageous entrepreneurship than the Orchard House in Stonington, Connecticut. And we're gonna to come to that. I'm gonna to try to get through this and we, you're gonna hear about it. Okay, uh, again, uh, he, he, here's the story of America. We, we talked about car travel, the changing needs of travel, the changing uh, modes of travel, transportation, the train travel, airline travel, uh, tourist destinations. Here's a book that's dedicated, part of it's dedicated to San Francisco. Uh, the book in the center is the last issue, is the last edition uh, it was now produced by a guy named Lamont Walker. Okay, the, uh, Mr. Green had died, passed away in 1960, and Mrs. Green uh, retired from the service, and Lamont Walker uh, po posted the last one. By this time, the world had changed. The, the Civil Rights Act of 64 had passed, the Voting Rights Act of 65 had passed, the Fair Housing Act was about to be passed, uh, and you'll notice one other significant change. If you look at that book, that one in the center, it's no longer green, okay? Uh, it's, and it's also called the Traveler's Green Book. It's not, no longer called the Negro Motorist Green Book. Okay, it's a, sim, it's a sign of the times. Uh, I mentioned that they did tourist destinations. Uh, they talked about, for example, Louisville or Savannah or New York, or, and they would say what to do there. Okay, but if you look a little bit clo closer, it tells more of a story here. They're talking about what to do in Louisville, and one of the features of Louisville, Kentucky, is that Louisville has two branches of the library for Negro readers. The libraries in Louisville were segregated. There were white libraries and black libraries, okay? And there it is right there. Okay. Uh, after the war in particular, guys came back and they had uh, things like the VA loans and the, and the GI Bill, which were uh, very difficult for, for black folks to get. Uh, and the uh, uh, the Green Book, uh, again, participated in that. They're supporting, uh, there's a whole article here about Negro colleges, uh, and they list them. The Negro colleges are what we know today as the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities. They listed them. You can go through the book and you, and you can find them. They also listed what they called Negro publications. If you were traveling around, you went to a city, and uh, you, wanted, you were looking for what th things to do. Uh, the mainstream newspaper may not have the things because of the Jim Crow system and, and, the, and the segregation. Uh, you, you may not be able to access the things that are in the paper. So they would tell you, if you go to Alabama, pick up this newspaper and, and that newspaper. So again, there was a sense of community that was developed by the Green Book. And the Green Book, and by the way, this is a copy of, this is the 1954 copy. You can buy all these online. They're about eight bucks a piece. There's about 10 of them out there that, uh, that you can buy. Here's a few of them right here. But uh, this one has the, the, uh, uh, the Orchard House in it, by the way. Uh, but if you notice the size, uh, it was designed so, to carry with you in the glove compartment. So people would buy it. It came out once a year, a couple of times. It came out twice, spring and fall. Uh, but you would put it in your car and keep it with you because you never know when you're going to need it. Okay. And people would read it throughout the year. 
Okay. Uh, again, uh, things are changing. 63, 64. We're not talking now. Uh, some of the, the civil rights laws are about to be passed. We're not talking about embarrassing situations. We're talking about a vacation without aggravation because the civil rights movement has taken hold. Uh, people are, are, are demanding rights and they're not, they're not just accepting it anymore. So it is even reflected here on the, on the cover of the, of the book. Uh, they also have articles now about civil rights, talking to you about your civil rights. Uh, and, and the congressmen that were in, that were in fighting for that. Uh, you might recognize Adam Clayton Powell there in the center. Again, these are excerpts from the book, okay? Uh, this is one of the most interesting pages in there. Uh, there's that uh, picture of the congressman, and they go through a whole bunch of the states, and they tell you what your rights are, or if you have a problem, this is, this is what you need to look out for, this is who to contact, okay? A very valuable resource if you're traveling through. The most interesting thing about that is what's not there. If you look at that list of states, okay, with the exception of Virginia, there are no, st this is around 1963-64, with the exception of Virginia, there are no states listed in there below the Mason-Dixon line. And that tells you where, this, where the civil rights issues were in terms of North, South, and, 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 and the differences there. Uh, they are still fighting civil rights in, in uh, Southern, South, Southern America. Okay. Some always some fascinating stuff in here. You remember uh, James Billboard Jackson was the uh, SO guy. Uh, this gentleman uh, uh, gave, uh, honored him by naming the gas station the Billboard SO service station. I looked at it, thought, oh, New Orleans, Louisiana, that's interesting. And if you look down in the lower corner, there's a name, E. L. Marsalis. I thought, wait a minute, you know, New Orleans, Marsalis, wait a minute. Uh, sure enough, uh, Mr. Marsalis, Ellis Marsalis. He had two uh, tourist homes, two uh, motels, and uh, the one, the lower one here was, uh, in addition to the gas station, uh, was also known as the Marsalis Mansion, and it was the it was the spot where when celebrity musicians came in from out of town, they couldn't stay in the hotels in the white hotels down in New Orleans, but they would come to places like the Marsalis Mot Mansion right here, and that exposed him and his family to a lot of very talented people. That's his grandson. And so it was reflected in that. Winton Marsalis and Branf Bran Branford Marsalis and uh, Jason Marsalis, and there's another one that has a big long name with a D. Uh, they are his grandsons. Their grandfather, Ellis Marsalis, ran an ESSO station. He was a civil rights activist and he was an entrepreneur. So again, this is a, this is a capsule history of, of America. This is a real interesting one right here that uh, in 1960, it was an ad for a, a supermarket in Memphis, Tennessee. That's Mr. Ware on the right. And you recognize those other two fellas. Uh, that's Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and, the, and Dr. Ralph Abernathy. Uh, not a bad endorsement in 1960, okay, at the, at the, as the civil rights movement is, is gaining strength. What struck me, though, was uh, I was going through the Memphis section. I turned the page. Two pages later, I saw this and I just said, oh my God. If you recall, these, are, these ads were adjacent to each other, basically. The Lorraine Motel on April 4th, 1968 is the spot where Martin Luther King was assassinated on the balcony. And when I saw, I just got, I got chills when I, when I saw that, I said, my God, what a, what a history that is, what a coincidence. Okay, so Jim Crow America. We'll go back to that for a second. How do we know it was Jim Crow America? Because we have Jim Crow uh, system throughout the country, including New London and including Stonington. So Lee, if you would, that's my spiel on, that's my answer to that question. As far as, <laughs> as, far as the movie, what's in the movie, none of this stuff is in the movie, okay? This is the real green book, okay? The movie, well, I'll leave it at that. I wish Spike oh. Lee, I wish Spike Lee had made that movie instead of <laughs> the people who did it. There you go. But we do have a, the local connection in New London, which, which is really fascinating. Uh, you've already kind of looked at the history of the Green Book uh, and, and sort of how that intersects with what's going on in America. So why don't you tell me a little bit about the people who actually opened up their homes in New London? Uh, what kind of folks were these? And you know. it's, it, it's, a, it's real interesting because I started looking at them and there, and there is a pattern that develops. Uh, a, a lot of the people who operated the tourist homes were older women, okay? And, 
and I uh, and so I, I was thinking about that, and I I know that the there there may have been a variety of reasons, but one of the things that it showed is that they may have been doing it to supplement their income. They were also doing it as a sense of family and community in providing a service that was needed to tr their traveling brethren. Okay, and and in addition to that, they were also entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and again, a classic example of that, and we'll get to that in a, just a couple minutes, is the Orchard House, which which clicks off, checks off all of those boxes. Sure. Now, I guess a lot of these things were lodging facilities, but you also had other uh, things like hair salons, gas stations. Uh, did you see anything in New London besides uh, the rooms for rent? The only one was, was right down here. All of these were, were uh, private uh, homes, except for the Crocker House and the, and the uh, where is it, the Mohegan Hotel. And they came in late in the game. But uh, Boone's Beauty Shop was a place down on Main Street. It's now known as Eugene O'Neill Drive. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, th that was the only one that was not a, not a residence. And they did have apartments upstairs. And when I first gave this talk, one of the guys that spoke on the panel uh, had actually lived there during that time. And he knew all the, it was amazing. He's another one guy, he's, uh, he's 90, 92, I think now, Mr. Spencer Lancaster of New London. Uh, a wonderful guy, by the way. And, uh, but he actually lived at the, at, uh, above Boone's Beauty Shop when he first got married. Hmm. Okay. And there, there would be people's phone numbers in the book so people could call in advance to get a room? Uh, that's generally the way it went. Or they, or they wrote letters. They wrote letters, yes. Okay. Uh, by, yeah, by the 1930s, they mostly had phones. All right. Um, so we're going to move it along a little bit because obviously you focused on New London, but, uh, you know, the uh, research you've done most recently involved uh, some entries in Stonington, uh, one of which was the Orchard House. But tell me a little bit about uh, when you went into Stonington, what you found uh, regarding the, uh, well, the Green Book. Okay. Uh, at, at first, I didn't find anything uh, because I was looking for the year-round places. And uh, it, I didn't realize that there were separate listings for places that were only open in the summertime, okay, at first. But what I did was I, I, I did the same kind of thing with Stonington that I did with that New London map. And I, I, these are the, there are four places that are listed in uh, Stonington. Two of them are the Orchard House. The Orchard House first uh, location up here on Liberty Street. The second one, which we'll be talking the most about down here across from Stonington High School. Uh, there was the Reverdy Ransom Guest House, which was down here on Route 1. This is all on Route 1, by the way. And the, I don't know how to pronounce this. Uh, wick Wickety Quack. What is it? Wickety Quack. Wickety Quack. All right, I'm going to defer to you every time that word comes up. But Wickety Quack. Okay, uh, that was, uh, this was also not a residence. This was a business that was uh, catering to uh, people who were interested in, in, in boat rentals and that sort of stuff. Uh, but you can see they're all kind of clustered together here. The fifth place is Mrs. or Mrs. Sills. And that, I learned that from talking online from some of the people who remembered. And they told me, including, including Sandra Good Ferguson, I think she's the one who mentioned it. Uh, and I think this, this, the, one of the Simmons uh, mentioned it too, that there was a restaurant down here at uh, right where the uh, firehouse is right now, the Wickedy Quack uh, Firehouse. There was a restaurant that was owned by a black couple. I only know they were named Mr. and Mrs. Sills, and they had a daughter named Wanda. But beyond that, I don't know very much. Maybe we'll learn more about that, that tonight. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, you know, you mentioned the Orchard House. We happen to have three members of the family that owned the Orchard House uh, way back when uh, with us tonight. Tom well, asked them uh, to come and share. Sorry. I, I do want to, I want to cover a little more material before we okay. introduce those. Okay. My, my error. Okay. Uh, the history, the, the history uh, in, of, of black people living in Stonington goes way back. And one of the things that a lot of people may not know is that in 1774, New London County had the largest population and the largest percentage of, of enslaved people in New England. Okay. New London County. And it was largely because of three towns uh, that, that dominated. New London had 522 people who were enslaved. Stonington had 456. And Groton had 390. Now, this was the, the overall, the percentage of enslaved people in New England was about 2.3%. 2 but in New London, it was 10%. 
okay? And in Stonington, I'm not sure what the, the percentage was, but it was high because the uh, population of Stonington was less than in London. Uh, so this goes back a long time. I mean, it, 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 this is not a recent history. Uh, and uh, when I was, uh, our friend Gail McDonald uh, wrote a book uh, recently and uh, talked about that and talked about some of the black, uh, the, the, the work that they did in Stonington with the railroad and the steamship industry. And, and actually I have to give credit to Gail. She's the one that, that tipped me off to the, to the uh, Orchard House. She approached me one night, I was at a lecture in London, and she approached me one night, and she, she knew I was doing the, the Green Book. And she said, uh, Tom, do you know about the Orchard House? And I said, uh, in Stonington. And I said, uh, uh, no, I don't. I, she said, it's in the Green Book. And I said, uh, you know, I've, I've looked through the Green Book for, you know, page by page, you know, for, for a long time, and, and I didn't see it. And she said, oh no, it was there. And I thought, huh, how did I, could I have missed that? I don't know how I missed it. So, uh, a, a, a couple of weeks, a couple of months or so later, my friends from Stonington, who are natives, uh, Pierce and Levina Keppel, who are high school classmates of mine, basically said the same thing. They said, uh, you know about the Orchard House, the place with the pillars down on Route 1. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, I, 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 miss, I definitely missed something here. Uh, so I went back and uh, started looking again in the, uh, uh, in the Green Book. And I, let, me, let me just pause for a second and go back and just touch on this. Uh, when Gail uh, talked about the population, the black population in uh, the mid 1800s in Stonington, she mentioned the school. Well, I looked up the map. Here's an 1868 map of the school of, of, of Stonington. This is the borough. Okay, the library is right here. Okay, if you look over here, there's a school. It's written right on the building. It says colored school. Stonington had a segregated school system in 1868. Okay, there was another school for the white children down on Schoolhouse Lane, down at the point. Okay, that's listed there. And then she also mentions the African American Baptist Church. That's right over here. Okay, it's gone now. Okay, it's right next to the cemetery. There's a Robinson Cemetery right there. Uh, but uh, anyway, that just gives you a little snapshot of, of Stonington back in those days. Anyway, so I went back to the Green Book and I said, I, I got to get to the bottom of this. And I found, sure enough, I found the Reverdy Ransom Guest House. Uh, in, in Stonington, and I thought I missed that the first time. It's in the vacation section. It's not in the regular listings. Then I went look back a little further, and I found the, what's it called? What do you call it again, Lee? The Wickety Quack? Uh, yep, you got boat, it. Boat company, and I found that. Still no Orchard House. I thought, what the heck is going on here? Then I went a little further, and this is what I found. There it is, Rhode Island, right in the middle. It says, Westerly Rhode Island Orchard House. No wonder I didn't find it. I wasn't looking in Rhode Island. I was looking in, in Connecticut. And of course the Orchard House was actually in Connecticut. It was in Stonington. And I don't know, it's a mystery to me. Maybe uh, our, our guest tonight can shed some information on that. Uh, I don't know why they listed it in Westerly, other than that maybe Westerly is a more prestigious address than, than, than Stonington uh, or a more recognizable address uh, perhaps. But anyway, there it is. Okay, and it was run by Mrs. Minnie Carter and Mrs. Gertrude Owens. They were from Brooklyn. And, uh, and again, I don't know how they came to be in Stonington. Perhaps our guests can uh, shed some light on that. I don't know. They came here, they established the Orchard House, the first one on 194 Liberty Street. This is it right here. It's still there, okay? This is a Google Street view of the house. Here's another view. You can see it's got a field stone, a very a beautiful landscape. Uh, it's got a field stone uh, siding on the first floor. And I happened to go by there about two weeks ago and I stopped in and uh, it was for sale, okay? Uh, $495,000. Uh, here's, they're doing a little work in the driveway or they're next to the garage. You can see the stone there. Up in the left hand corner of that, you will see a pool. Now, I don't know if the pool was there back in, uh, in, the, back in the day, but I went down to town hall, I looked up the records. This is when they bought the property, March 19th, 1938. Okay, there's Minnie Carter, Gertrude Owens, taken out a mortgage. Uh, they sold it on January 4th, 1946. Okay, and they purchased, uh, a month and a half later, they purchased another property from Margaret Van Allen. That other property is this one. Okay, this is the orchard house that people are more familiar with. And notice there are two pillars there in the front. Those are those stone pillars. This is a painting uh, that hangs down in the building that's on the site now. The orchard house is gone. Okay, 
what, would, what, what was going on in America briefly when they bought this? We're still in Jim Crow America. Look at the headline down at the bottom of that page. The date is August 3rd, 1946. This is three months after they opened up the, uh, the Orchard House and we're dealing with a lynching in the, in the South, okay? All right, this is a very special picture. I wanna thank Downing Simmons Jr. for sending it to me. Uh, this is the Orchard House. As far as I know, it's the only picture of the Orchard House out there. You can see the sign over here. This was the main guest house. This was a, a building known as the uh, Tea Room, if I'm not mistaken. And this is where they served the dinners that made them famous. Uh, they would draw people from miles around to come here for dinners. In addition to the guests that, that were staying there, people came from the, from the neighboring towns uh, to have dinner there. Again, here's the stone pillars. And I would love to know who this little child is right here. I don't know who she is. He or she is. I shouldn't say that. I don't know. Uh, this is an article that was in the paper uh, announcing the opening, May 1946. Gives a little description of the 14 bedrooms. This is not a little place, okay? Uh, and a, a description of attractively furnished, okay? Very nice place. It was an upscale place, okay? Uh, this is a survey map that I found down in, in, in uh, Town Hall. Uh, they, uh, they purchased actually about 35 acres, okay? They own this whole property here. This is the orchard house down here. This is the tea room. Okay, uh, at, at some point along the line, they sold off pieces of it. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure, we may get into that a little bit later, but I know uh, that they, uh, some houses were built down here. Uh, and here's a close up of it. These are houses that were owned by, uh, I'm not sure if they were family members or, or exactly who they were, maybe we'll find out. But again, here's the orchard house, here's the tea room. They had ancillary buildings, uh, a garage. Uh, this is an aerial shot taken in the 60s, Stonington High. These are those existing houses. Here's the orchard house. Here's the tea room. Okay, those stone pillars are right there in the, in the, in the thing. You can see the driveway right there. And there were other buildings, uh, maybe a, a garage or a, a chicken coop. I don't, I don't recall exactly what it was. Here's, speaking of phone numbers, here are the phone numbers. You can see Gertrude Owens has the same phone number as the orchard house. I found that in one of the old phone books. This is what it looks like today. There's a huge office complex here. Okay, there are the pillars. They're still there. Uh, and that painting that you saw, it hangs in the lobby. If you will, you can, this is open to the public. I just walked in there one day because I heard it was there, thanks to Gail McDonald and, and some, some other people on this form, on that form. And uh, I walked in, sure enough, that's where I found that picture. Okay. Uh, at some point uh, in 1952, I should say, uh, 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 I, I mentioned that they parceled out, uh, subdivided some of that land. Uh, a piece of that land was bought by Downing Simmons senior, okay, and Doris Simmons, his wife, and that is the mother of our guests here tonight, okay, Doris Simmons. They bought a piece of that property. Okay, I just want to end with, with one thing here. Uh, Victor Green said many times in, in his book, he, this, you can find this quote in his Green book. It says, there will be a day sometime in the near future when this guide will not have to be published. And that is when we as a race will have equal rights and privileges in the United States. So my question here, it's a question that's, uh, that I'll leave you with that is uh, been asked by travelers from time immemorial, okay? And we are all travelers here. We are travelers here and we are engaged in a national conversation about racial justice and, and racial equity. And, uh, and we're in the midst and, and black lives, uh, the importance of black lives. And uh, so my question is, after all of this, are we there yet? I just want to, in closing, I just want to give a special thank you to Mrs. Sandra Good Ferguson, because without her gracious help, we would not have this very special program. Mrs. Good Ferguson is the person who put me in touch with our, with our honored guests here tonight, and I want to thank her uh, publicly for that help. And I, I have two other Thanks. I want to thank Pierce and Levina Keppel for their help in helping, and Gail McDonald for helping me find that uh, the, the Orchard House listing and the London Landmarks. And I have two friends in New London who are also contributors to this, Nicole Thomas and Fuji Fulgaris. Okay, Lee. All right, Tom. Good job. Uh, we're making a little history tonight, so uh, let's okay. uh, let's get on to that part yes. of it because uh, there's a lot of stuff we don't know about the Orchard House at this point. So we have uh, invited three uh, guests from the family uh, that owned the Orchard House way back when. 
Uh, Tom's invited them here tonight and they're here uh, uh, and they're going to be uh, unmuting themselves and, and putting on their cameras shortly. Um, so I would like to introduce the three grandchildren of the late Minnie Carter, who with her sister, the late Gertrude Owens, owned and operated Orchard House. Um, we have Downing, Simming, I'm sorry, Downing Simmons Jr. from Ontario, Canada. We have Gregory Simmon, Simmons from North Carolina and Lynn Stallworth from New Jersey. So welcome all. Um, hope you can get on your cameras and, and microphones and I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Um, we're delighted to have you here tonight. Um, so I'm gonna ask you one question at a time about the, your Orchard House memories. Uh, first, can, can you tell me what your relationship to the Orchard House was and how your family came to own it? Let's start with Dan. How they came to own it, I believe it was, this is from recollection I have to remember that at that time I was 14, 15 years old and they didn't really discuss a lot of the uh, details around uh, how they purchased it. Uh, they're very kind in general to all of us. And um, so I believe they had a bank loan. Uh, they had some money from where they sold it and the people who sold, from where they sold the old Orchard House on Liberty Street. And I believe they had a, just a regular bank lo loan, not a bank, necessarily a bank, but some sort of lending service of some type and they paid that off over the years. Now someone, maybe Greg or Lynn or someone knows something different than that, but that's my best recollection of it was because I seem to remember that um, Graham talking about uh, having to pay the bill. All right, Gregory, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? And, and was it an existing building, I assume? It wasn't built for them. Well, I, I don't know. It's a little bit before my time, um, to be honest. Um, they probably did get some kind of a loan. Um, I know they like to save money <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe they had a little nest egg from Brooklyn um, from the connection of New Haven, Brooklyn, and then um, Stonington. But uh, they didn't they didn't discuss money <laughs> with me. You know, they, they didn't. Uh, they just basically told me, uh, get to work. <laughs> right. That was that was their main thing. And do you know, I, I really don't know, to be honest with you. Okay. And Lynn, uh, what are what are your uh, memories of the Orchard House? You were the youngest of, of the three of you. Maybe you don't have many memories, but uh, do you remember? I any? have a lot of memories, but not when they bought it. I certainly know that my grandmother and my great aunt were very hard workers. Um, they worked their whole life in Brooklyn and in New Haven. And I'm sure that they saved um, a considerable amount of money in those days to be able to do that. Uh, do you know what kind of work they did in, in, in New York? I know my grandmother worked at, is it Horn and Hart at the um, uh, diner type of, I know she worked there for years, that I know. I'm not sure what my great aunt did, but I, that's what my grandmother did in New York. Then she had a whole different side job when she came to Connecticut along with the Orchard House because they needed to sustain themselves. The Orchard House was not enough. So they, when the Orchard House was closed, they also had jobs. So my grandmother was the operator, uh, uh, what do you call it, a elevator operator uh, for the Washington Trust Building. Mm -hmm. And my great aunt was a domestic aide. She worked in people's houses. Um, mm -hmm. So when the Orchard House wasn't open, even uh, you know, in the winter, um, that's what they did. All right. And Lynn, since you're on camera now, can you tell me about some of your positive experiences at the Orchard House? Uh, what were the guests like? Uh, what was it like to visit there? And what were some of the fun things you remember doing? Well, I didn't visit there. I worked there. Okay. Oh. So <laughs> I started very young. Um, I remember because my family lived in West. So I remember um, I would bike to the Orchard House, which wasn't that far. And certainly these days probably wouldn't do it. As a very young teenager, I would bike there. And my first job there was as a chambermaid. Um, then I did well with that. And I graduated um, to be a dishwasher. Okay, so I had the honor of washing many, many dishes. And then I reached the ultimate job there for me, which was a waitress. And the waitress job was not only a job that I enjoyed, but the reason I enjoyed it because I got to meet all the guests and I got to hear their stories. 
Were, were there some cool guests, I assume? Oh, they were very interesting guests. I mean, they were doctors and lawyers and businessmen, and they came from New York primarily, but I also know there were some that came from Washington, D.C. Wow. And the thing was interesting about them is that they kept coming back year after year, and they would have their weeks. So you would see a group that would get together every year for two weeks in July, and then you would see a different group. So um, as I grew up, they, you know, they saw me grow up, and I used to see them from year to year, things that happened. And they were very encouraging, very encouraging. Great. Gregory, what do you remember about uh, the Orchard House? You worked there too, I assume? Well, I did odd jobs uh, in the uh, summertime when it was the time they were open. Um, I went there periodically. They had me clean the shuffleboard, um, sweep up all the time. Um, and my reward, of course, was a good meal. That was my reward, and, and the meal was very, very good. To be honest with you, um, I heard the I heard the food was amazing. We had more. Yeah, yeah the food was legendary. To be honest with you, um, the the guests were very, very nice. Uh, you could get a sense from the guests that. They were so glad to be there. Uh, just try to imagine these are business. These people came from a distance, and they didn't, just didn't have the outlet that some of the whites had. You know, sure. so they had money, but they didn't spend it. And coming there to Connecticut was just just wonderful for them to be there. And I think maybe one of the reasons why they said West Rhode Island uh, in that booklet is. They went to the beaches, and the beaches were mainly in Westerly, Rhode Island, which is, like Lynn said, just a, a bicycle ride away, you know. So maybe maybe that's why they did that. I don't know. Um, I, I know that you know when they got there, um, the people were fairly nice to them, um, especially when they spent their money. Okay, they liked to spend money, but as long as they didn't live there. Um, when I say lived, I mean in the city, uh, in the town, everything was okay, but they, they loved that money. And, you know, it, it was just a good good experience uh, for all the people involved. I can tell you about obstacles and stuff, but we'll, we'll get to that later. All right, yep. Downing, can you tell me a little bit? Was there uh, great food? Was there music, uh, dancing? What was, what, what, what was going on there? What, what were some of the fun activities? Yeah, it was great activities they had. There were very high class activities. Uh, along with the people that came there, of course, they had archery. Uh, I remember playing croquet, a shuffleboard, um, tennis uh, was there. Wow. Uh, they also had brought in movies from time to time and showed movies in the tea room. Uh, they also had bicycles, and the bicycles uh, before they were there before the Sorrentine High School was there, and uh, that was built much later. And people used to go. There was a park across the street, and everyone took their bicycle across the street, and they rode to it was some type of a park. It was a um, state park or a small state park. And I have a, 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 just a memory of there. I used to go to, after the guests had left and whatever, I'd go to the state park and I'd go in the back to the picnic tables because um, not only did they come to the park, but many other people did. And they used to, uh, play games, used to play cards, and sometimes money was exchanged. This is penny ante stuff, but um, they uh, often lost money and it fell through the cracks in the um, the tables. And I finally remember, I'd always go to those tables, and I'd always <laughs> find a quarter or 50 cents, and I was delighted. I was about 15 years old about that time, something like okay. that. What, what, what was the tea room all about? That sounds pretty high class, too. Well, yeah. I understand, Lenny pointed out very rightfully that they came from New York and New Haven. Their skill level was so incredibly high that not only did they, the food was great and all of that, but they also knew all the manners, they knew all the proper um, etiquette, they knew how to run a restaurant, uh, they knew how to treat staff, they knew how to keep people. Uh, so their level of skill was uh, far beyond many of the the local restaurants, and they just when they were so successful. And I think I'm going to, I don't think, uh, I'm just sort of talking about uh, this tea room and thing now, but I think you don't want to hear right now 
about some of the lessons I learned. I think comes later, right? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna ask yeah. that a little bit later. So it was a wonderful place to be. I learned a lot there, and um, they also hired um, people from uh, who were doing so well, perhaps in New Haven, New York. Uh, these were good people, but poor people sometimes. And they brought them in, um, and they treated them absolutely fabulously. And I remember one particular fellow who was quite weak. He came in quite emaciated. And, um, you know, not only did he work there a little bit, and they were kind of light on him, he also ate very well there. And by the time <laughs> he left, he, he, he ate gained a few several pounds. pounds and looked like a, a new man. <laughs> That's great. A lot of activities probably had him having some fun, too. Did, did the people who worked there live on the grounds? There was one gentleman who did live there uh, full time, but generally they just came for the summer. Most of them uh, came in as a temporary staff. Okay. We call them aunts and uncles kind of thing, all that weren't related to us. Uh, but they all had their own very distinct personalities, which uh, Lynn and Greg and I all remember. And they were all wonderful personalities, but they were uh, people who had survived a tremendous amount. So uh, they had some. Uh, some interesting sayings that I still even say today. Okay. You want, are, can you say them or no? Well, one of them was, um, <laughs> one of the gentlemen used to always say, everything's chicken. I said, everything's chicken, what does that mean? Well, he <laughs> meant, everything's okay. <laughs> and and he mean? also used to say, um, how are you going to get there? Well, Jim and Joe's going to take me. Jim and Joe, Jim and Joe who? Well, Jim's my right foot. And Joe's my left foot. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And uh, uh, he, he was a, a wonderful gentleman and uh, he was very kind. Very cool. Uh, tell me a little bit about Minnie and Aunt Gertie. Uh, uh, what were they like and how did they affect your life? Well, for me, um, I have to say they taught me about life and death, really. Uh, I really learned the lesson of life and death. Um, one day, uh, Aunt Gertie was... She was the main chef there. She was cooking some brown bread because they were having beans. And she put it in the, she was doing many, many, many things all the time, as most chefs cooks do. But she put a can of brown beans in the oven and didn't put a hole in them. So you can imagine what happened. The oven was very, very hot. By the way, I used to cook with oil stoves then too. I used to get the oil, bring it. But the, the can of beans, I asked her for something and she went over to get it to me. When she went to get it to me, the can of beans, not beans, but brown bread exploded, blew the door off, shrapped all of the ceiling, and she okay. could have been killed. So I was very, at that moment, I realized how valuable life was. But Graham used to, that's one lesson I learned about life. But Graham used to always tell me, she said, if someone tells you to jump off a bridge, would you do it? She used to say, I was just a happy looking kid. I never thought about anything like that. But when I got into high school, all the guys were smoking, and you know, I didn't have very many friends, so I was the only black kid in the high school, really. And, um, um, you know, they were all smoking, encouraged me to smoke, and I promised myself, from, I remember this very distinctly, from 16 to 17, I'm not going to smoke. Not good for me. And when I became 17, I told myself, I'm not going to smoke until I'm 18. It's not good for me. I'm not going to jump off that bridge. Mm -hmm. So many people have not learned that lesson in life, and I'm not going to go into any names, <laughs> but we can think of many people um, who've had uh, financial careers and their, their sons or whatever have ended up in bad straits. But more subtly, more subtly, uh, if you're a battered husband, you're a battered wife, you know, don't accept abuse. You know, if you're in high school or junior high and you're gay, or something like that, and people are making fun of you. Don't accept that. Don't jump off that bridge. Don't let people tell you what your life is going to be. So I learned all those things that have lasted with me my entire life. That's great. That's great. That's one of my mother's favorite expressions too, by the way. So <laughs> I learned it early too. Uh, Lynn, what are your some some of your memories of Minnie and Aunt Gertie uh, as far as what type of people they were? The memory of Aunt Gertie is she was the most phenomenal cook I have ever met in my life. And she would do everything by memory. In fact, we tried to replicate her recipes and we never could. What that kind of cooking? Gertie. Amazing, amazing. But my grandmother was the businesswoman. She was the one who taught me about hard work. 
as I said, I got promoted within the workings of the Orchard House from chambermaid to, um, you know, to waitress. But along with that, my grandmother also paid for my music lessons. I started piano when I was five years old and continued piano and continue it now. And she was the one who, again, hard work. So when the guests came every year, she would ask me to play for them. So that would help instill my self-confidence, wow. um, from, again, from five all the way through. But the other thing that was a life lesson to me is she always said, if you, do, if you work hard, you will gain your reward. And I worked hard. And when I graduated from high school, I also had another cousin at the same age graduated from high school. She sent myself and my cousin to South America. And she did that and her, what she said to me, Lynn, these are the kind of things that you will be able to do if you continue to work hard. So those were the kind of lessons and the values she instilled in me just by being around her and the quality that she, she had. That's great, that's great. We're running out of time a little bit, but I, I wanna ask uh, Gregory, uh, what some of the uh, things uh, that Minnie and Gertie had to go through in the community? Uh, do you have any examples of some of the struggles? What was the reaction from the community? And do you know why they chose Stonington? Well, they probably had a pretty good deal in a good spot um, that was near the beach. But I can tell you about one of the obstacles they ran into um, they had a successful business, but remember, it was only during the summer 10 weeks, so they had to subsist the rest of the year. But there was one instance I can remember where she was fully booked, all right? Uh, and I don't know if she overbooked or a doctor came up from New York or whatever, but she was in kind of a tizzy because she was overbooked and she had one person to put up. And she had, at least she thought she had a good relationship with the person across the street, right down the street, just about, about 100 yards, um, they had a motel, okay? I'm not mentioning any name, but this is fact. And on the motel, they had a, a vacancy or no vacancy, you know, sign there, and it showed uh, vacancy. So my grandmother went to the lady who's always nice to her, waved at her, hi, Millie, how are you doing today? And said, we, we have a situation uh, where we have a doctor that's coming in and I'm overbooked. Do you mind? And this is a doctor now, you know, well-mannered, nice gentleman, whatever. Um, could you please just put him up for one night because one of our guests is leaving tomorrow and it'll be solved. Well, what happened, of course, is the lady looked at my grandmother and said, Minnie, I'm sorry, but I just can't do that. Just can't do that, Minnie. I'm sorry. <laughs> And that, you know, when I heard that story, that really resonated with me to let you see exactly what racism is all about. The lady who was really nice to her face all the time, when it came right down to helping her out, well, the lady could have made money. Right. She'd rather not make money and, you know, and do that. So that's, that's my story about that. Okay. Uh, right. But they, they were very, they were very good people. And this is the kind of things that they had to put up with. That's just one example. Yeah. Downing, do you remember some uh, examples of uh, struggles uh, with the community uh, not necessarily accepting Orchard House or, or your grandmother? Well, um, I don't have a specific one like Gregory does, but um, I know that um, everybody was very friendly to them during the summer uh, months, but uh, so, um, and respected them and would often say we miss your people when they're not here because uh, they often bought cars and big items things like that um, and, and and the stores and that kind of thing so they would miss them but they never really talked about how successful a business they were and how well they did and many times not many times but i can remember a food inspector coming in and um Graham and uh, Aunt Gertie said uh, they had had a, some discussion with somebody. So somebody was competing with them in the business in the business world. So they felt that they, the uh, food inspector had been, been told to go and inspect their place, give them a, a, a once over, you know, being just a little too successful, perhaps. And um, of course, the place was spotless. 
And um, <laughs> I remember what he said. He said, you know, the only thing I can find around here is one teacup should be turned the other way. <laughs> he tested the water, he tested everything, and everything wow. was just perfect. Great, great. But they never uh, got the recognition that they really deserved. Yeah, okay. Lynn, do you have anything you wanted to add to it? I do. I, I grew up, we were all five years apart. So it was a different time when I was there and I didn't really see um, some of the problems that my brother noticed, to be honest with you. Okay. All right. Well, we've been going at it for about an hour, so I did want to open it up to uh, questions. So hey, I can I just we'll... add something? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I had heard was that at the time they were trying to buy the orchard house that there was a lot of resistance in the neighborhood and that the, the lady who owned it was Mrs. Van Allen. And she took the stand that basically the heck with those people, I'm going to sell it to you folks. If I can use the term, darn the torpedoes. Uh, and she did it, but I, I don't know. That was just a story I heard through, uh, you know, it's kind of through the grapevine, but I know there was, <coughs> some resistance in in Stonington. I don't know what form that took or whatever, but that would have been in, in 1946. Well, can I can I say something? Yes. Yeah, sure. yeah uh, Simi, you can relay this. Um, you, you know, Rhode Island and Connecticut was right next to each other. You could walk from one state to the next. But Simi, you can tell them about the problem we had getting our house westerly. You know, I don't know if you want to expound on it, just to, just to give you a little, you know, a taste of what it was all about. Yeah, this was a general attitude um, at the time. I think you're right, uh, Mr. Chuck, about uh, what you said uh, about uh, they did, the person who sold it to them, sold it to them anyway over some objections and resistance. But also, we bought our house. We lived, um, we lived... Uh, just down the street from the Orchard House for a couple of years. And I went to West Forest Street High School at that time. But then the bigger house or a different house. So we, mom and dad wanted to buy another place. So they were looking places in Westerly to find. And um, they would definitely uh, push from side to side from, from time to time. When they were looking for a house, they weren't given full consideration, let's say. So when they found a nice house on a, a particular street that we lived in for quite a while. Uh, and uh, I, sorry, I didn't find the house, I actually found, the, the, I think, the property. But um, they weren't able to buy it because someone found out that, you know, we were Negroes or we were black or whatever. So they weren't, they were turning it down. So luckily, my father had very good relations in the, in the Westerly uh, from he participated in baseball and sports and other things. He's a kind and gentle man. And one of his friends said, that's ridiculous. He says, I'll buy the house and then I'll sell it to you for a dollar. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. Um, got that house, or sorry, sold for a dollar. And that's how we got the property. But we would never live in it. We would have never lived in that neighborhood. It's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that story. I really appreciate it. Um, all right, so I think uh, Michaela is going to take over and help us uh, ask questions from the uh, from the crowd here. On Sundays, Sunday, I think um, there may have been a few because Sundays was the day that most people from the outside came in for a Sunday meal. And that Sunday meal, the appetizer was a half of a lobster with a uh, tomato stuffed with coleslaw. That was the appetizer. Then the full meal was, and it was the same every, every Sunday, was fried chicken, oh my God, macaroni and cheese. I don't remember what other vegetable there was. And of course, homemade biscuits, homemade biscuits and rolls. Um, and then dessert was blueberry bowl, which was a, a some concoction that my aunt made that we can't replicate. But that was Sunday. So people came from church, from community to eat on Sunday. And on occasion, you would see somebody right there, on occasion. 
Yes, I would say that there is, if I can say, I could say that uh, there was no hostility or anything like that. And that's what Graham and I Gary taught us our whole life. There was no hostility between the races, although they would suffered because of it greatly. Um, that was the most amazing thing that I can remember. And I think some of the staff were occasionally white also. Maybe Lynn, you know about that. Occasionally, not as, not on a steady basis, but um, but Graham used to uh, also go into the city sometime to find uh, black staff. She could find them. And some of the local black folks and uh, younger people, Lynn's age or whatever, uh, also worked there. So everybody knew about the Orange Mm-hmm. And they I, were very well respected. They went to the beaches in, in Westerly, Misquamacid Beach. Um, and I know they might have ventured to Watch Hill, which is a pretty exclusive area, but they probably, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Lynn, they probably went more. Um, to Misquamacid Beach, and even to uh, Watch Hog Pond, they just they, was, they were just glad to get away. To be honest with you, um, I don't know about that Stonington Pier, um, the town of little little area called uh, is it called uh, Stonington Pier or whatever. They might have gone there also, and maybe some of them might have gone to um, New London to Ocean Beach. But Ocean Beach wasn't wasn't quite up to the up to par compared to Miss Quamicat Beach, in my opinion. People went to Stony and Stonington because it was a quaint little town, and people from New York and New Haven liked to walk around in those shops and boutiques that were there, as well as Westerly. So they did the uh, Stonington as well as the Westerly, and perhaps uh, New London sometimes, uh, but. Um, they were on vacation enjoying themselves and wanted to see the local area. Mm -hmm. They really ran a tight ship. There were no on the on the premises. There was never any gambling. Um, people really behaved themselves in a really, really good decorum. So the community looked, you know, really well on the whole establishment. You know, as far as they, you know, as much as they could at the time. Thank you. Any other, anything else to add to that question? Well, you know, they had a lot of activities on the premises. Like um, my brother had said, from shuffleboard to they had their own tennis courts to horseshoes to all kinds of things, movies. Um, so people were pretty entertained. And like I said, you know, people came like in groups. So, you know, on this week of this month, this group were going to be there. So they were people from different places, but they just said, this is our week at the Orchard House. And they would enjoy spending so much time together that they didn't do a lot of outside things, not to my recollection. Thank you, Lynn. There was recollection there, too. Uh, I remember uh, Gary telling me and Graham telling me that near the end, by the end, and Gertie was becoming ill and she eventually passed away. But before that, they said they were getting a lot of requests because it's such a high clientele for more activities. Um, they were the shuffleboard and the archery and the, the, were, were wonderful, but they wanted something add, added on. And uh, these are the resorts and things were starting to open up and the resorts are starting to add a lot more activities. And they wanted to have those at the Archer House. So that, but you have to remember Graham and Gertie were quite old at that time. And it was best at that time they felt maybe we've done our, our, our bit or whatever and now it's time to move on. Um, they were always very careful about that. They, they wanted to keep the level of service and wanted people to really enjoy themselves. So it was kind of a mutual fading out of the Orchard House eventually. Um, we talked about that, didn't we? Um, we're not sure if it started the Memorial Day or before. 
Um, and we think it went into early September, maybe right after Labor Day. I think after that's Labor pretty Day. much the time frame. I don't think they formally I served alcohol, uh, but occasionally uh, the guests would want to drink and they'd go out and buy some alcohol. And when they, because they're on vacation, they have a sociable drink while they're playing cards or something like that. Um, but it was very, very low key. It was no, um, I, I don't I hardly remember any alcohol at all. I remember, and I was there, I worked there two or three years, so I was around the guests quite a bit. And um, there was very little of that. What I remember, um, as being the waitress, I remember yeah. that if they had alcohol, they would bring it with them to the table. It was never served from the establishment. It's like a BYOB, right? So um, they could get mixers, they could get ginger ale, those kinds of things, but they would bring their own bottle of whatever they chose to the table. Brown bag. There was one um, predominantly African-American church, Pleasant Street Baptist Church, and that's the church where my grandmother and my aunt went and the um, Blacks in the community went. That's the predominant church, and that was in Westerly. Mm -hmm. there, were some, um, there were some guests who did occasionally go to the church. I do remember that. It wasn't a lot of them, but occasionally someone went to the church. Um, Graham and I very didn't go a lot at that time because it was so very, very busy, so they couldn't go. Uh, but there was a good, and we, the ministers in the black church there were mostly um, students and uh, um, uh, ministers, I don't know what you'd call it, they had to do their bit after they took their courses. They would come to the church and they'd be there for a while, but not, uh, so we saw a string of ministers I remember many of them, <laughs> and many of them were, were quite uh, colorful, let's say that. Uh, but they, it was a good experience for sure. And that's how I learned a lot of morals in my life, too. Your, your dad was a singer, too, wasn't he? Yes, he was a singer, uh, quite good. He, uh, my father was one of three brothers, and um, two of them sang like, um, just had a natural uh, talent my father and Eddie and um, Ralph and his sister, Edith also, they all sang in choirs. And that's, and my mother also sang in many choirs. Um, and my father would uh, go to some churches in, in New London on occasion, he would sing there also. So, and it, cause he was a, he also sang at funerals and weddings occasionally. Uh, there was a lot of music in the family. Um, I'd say generally on the conservative side. Dad was a paid professional. He was he sang in churches in New London for years as a paid tenor. Correct. Yep. And you're into music also, are you not? I am. I yes. am. I'm a pianist. I'm a music director. I'm all kinds of things in music. And again, Grandma started that by paying for my piano lessons starting at age five. So that stuck with me. Wow. Did they have li live music at the Orchard House? Um, oh. I don't remember live music at the, I mean, of course I, I played the piano, piano, but other than that, I don't know that they did. I don't remember that. No. I think once they did have a live band come in, but it was very rare. Very rare. They had to sleep sometime. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have I mean, a couple you gotta remember, more questions. They had, oh, go ahead, Gregory. They had pigs. They had pigs. They had animals to take care of. They had people getting up early in the morning, and they were very, very busy at a advanced age. They were very um, special people, in my opinion. He married me My, um, early on, he married me. But um, yeah, I grew up in that church. That was our church, Pleasant Street Baptist Church. That was our church.
<laughs> I don't remember. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't remember. I really mo remember more doctors, lawyers, you know, those types of professionals, not so much famous people that you would think of. They were beautiful rooms, draperies, mug. I mean, we got, I, mean, I got to stay there off season. You know, they live there off season. So I remember I spent many a weekend there as my mom and dad would go to do things. Very well kept um, furniture, they had antiques um, in the hallways. It was quite, uh, it was beautiful, it was classy, um, something that would be hard to replicate now. Be um, I have a question. I'm curious why it perhaps it's obvious, but each of you have left this area. Um, what what pushed you away or invited you to come somewhere else? Well, I, I wanted to spread my wings a little bit. Uh, I lived in Westerly all my life. And I wanted <laughs> to go to college away like most young people. Um, same thing with Lynn, I guess. She went, did her graduate work, and she even got a doctorate up there in Boston. Wow. And, uh, you know, people just like to, like to travel. But uh, I moved my mother from Westerly to North Carolina, so I got the sweepstakes. That's the way I look at it. But Westerly's a, a, a good place, um, but it's, it's always good to broaden your horizon. That's the way I look at it. Thank you. For me, it was a little different. I went to college uh, in Boston, and when I graduated from college, I stayed in a kind of a, a, a buddy, a, sort of a home we all sort of shared. That was the day of the commune and the hippies and all of that kind of thing. And although I wasn't into that, there were shared living arrangements. And uh, every weekend, we used to travel uh, different places. We sometimes went to New Hampshire, sometimes we went to uh, London. We went all different places as a bunch in the house just to get out of the house and have some fun together as a group. And one time I came up to Canada and I went to Quebec City, I remember. I loved it so much. I thought it was such a great time that I went back again myself. I, I still loved it so much. So, um, and I felt such a difference in Canada and the United States. It was quite a different, it's quite a different country and uh, quite a different um, say culture, and I really enjoyed the culture so much. Uh, and discrimination was far, far less uh, here. So I, um, uh, I, so uh, when I decided, I decided to come to Canada for just a little while, and I would just make a few dollars, and uh, then come back to the States and buy a house. And that was my plan. But what happened was I actually stayed, bought a house, got married, I'm still here. <laughs> and I love Canada. It's a wonderful country. People want to talk about Canada. The United States is a wonderful country, but Canada is also. I'm in New Jersey because this is where my husband is from, from New Jersey. <laughs> but I was a New Englander. I spent a lot of time in uh, Boston, um, but I'm a New Englander at heart. My aunt died, and I think that was the end of the, my great aunt, you know, was owned by my grandmother, my great aunt, and when my great aunt died, um, that was the final, um, because it's not something that, aunt, um, it, it was a joint ownership, it's not something that my grandmother would do by herself, and it wouldn't be the same, so, because remember, my aunt was the cook, so right. um, okay. she died, that kind of ended it. Did they actually they sell did. the orchard house? They did. Yeah. Yes. They did. Yeah. We all cried. It was sold in 1973. Mm -hmm. And then Grandma um, came to live with us. We built onto our house in Westerly, which is where we live, and um, she lived with us at our house until she passed away. I remember um, uh, Graham saying that. Uh, the time Aunt Gertie was getting ill, she said, well, she said she would have to hire a, a chef or 
a cook or something like that. And she thought that was not what she really wanted to do at that age. She said it was time for her to move on. Mm -hmm. Just on, on, a, on, a broader, on a broader scale, what happened uh, in, the 60s, in the 70s, one, it's kind of a two-edged sword. Once those laws changed, the, the voting rights, the civil rights uh, law and the, and the Fair Housing Act, a lot of the businesses that had been sustained by the black community no longer had this, the same customer base because people now had the option to go other places. So what happened to a lot of the facilities was that they couldn't, they couldn't maintain it because on the, on the one hand, it was good that people could go to any place and no one could discriminate. On the other hand, the sense of community that had developed among the, the green book type places was, was uh, they kind of got the short end of the stick. And I don't know if that was the place. It sounds to me like the, the Orchard House was, was a really a, quite an exceptional upscale place. So I, I think the explanation of that, that Lynn just gave about her grandmother dying, I mean, her, uh, it was your aunt that died. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's just a, a, a huge thing to maintain. Uh, you know, at, at Minnie Carter's age. Uh, so that's, that's probably had a lot to do with it. I don't know when, did anybody know when the building disappeared? I mean, I, the big office complex on there now, I don't know when the Orchard House was demolished. Oh no. I remember when it happened, but I don't remember what year it was. Uh, I got it done in 72, I think, probably 74, somewhere around there. I th it was sold in 73. I have the deed. I, I, I did look oh, up the okay. deed. 73. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It sat there for a few years after it was sold. It did sit for a few years. I do remember that. It's such a beautiful historic house. Any idea how old it was? What age? Uh, I don't know. That. Yeah, it's but a, it's something beautiful from the top. I will say that the picture that they have, as you've shown it, when I looked at that painting, it's a um, artist rendition of it. It's not exactly the way it looked. Um, it's, it's, it's a good, it's very nice when you go, but it's not exactly as the Orchard House looked. It's an artist interpretation of that house. Right. I, I did try to actually reach out to try to find the artist to find out where did she get that image? There must be another photographer. How did she know uh, what it looked like in order to paint it? But I, I have been unsuccessful so it's far. It's very close, it's very close, but it's not quite there. But I, I don't take away from the artist at all. No, no. Uh, a little different. Great question. Mom might have something stashed away. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Mom might have some in her things. I, I can look for that because she got enough junk up there now. <laughs> I was going to say, don't throw anything out. No, no, these are all treasures. This is your, this is your book. This that's is right. your book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think Lynn has a few things. I'm not sure. But I know I have, every time dinner was served, they'd have a chime, they'd ring. Mm. Go bong, 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 bong. Mm. I still have that chime. Oh, yeah. Once in a while, I ring it. Wow. And I have a table from there. Yeah, we have some things. Wow. What a great memory. Great people. Great, great people. Well, I just want to say, I don't know if we're at an end here, but I want to say, I can't be, I can't tell you how grateful I am to, to you three in particular and to everybody who's contributed to, to Lee and to the Stonington Free Library. Uh, and I am so happy to have had the opportunity to be a part of this. It was, this is, this is magical historical stuff. And thank you so much. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. Yes. It's wonderful. Well, from the library, thank you all. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Yes, thank you First so much, everyone. In the United States. We can't thank you enough. Oh, Jackie had a, a funny comment. She wants to know if you will ring the chime for us, Downing. <laughs>
I can if you give me a second. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, it's, get, it's in the other room, but it's, I can bring it in if you want. Yeah, go ahead and get it. Go get it. Okay. Yes. What, what a great ending. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if it was, you know, tucked away somewhere. Right. That would be great. We just have lots of thank yous in, in the comments um, for everyone sharing their, their stories, uh, your, your stories and your family memories. So I will send, I'll send the... Oh. <laughs> it's dinner time. Yeah, I was going to say, does that mean dinner <laughs> Wow. Wow. What a great, what a great ending. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Did you plan that, Downing? That's okay. <laughs> you had it awful handy. It was awful handy. It wasn't. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, everyone. Much. Good night, everybody. Take care. Thank Have you. a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Eat well. Thank you all.